Hey guys, welcome to the podcast this week. Um, I wanted to record this little bit before and kind of let you know that this is going to be a little different because I'm actually re-releasing the very first episode of Drum History from April of 2018. Uh, My guest was Kelly Ray Tubbs, and uh, the topic is the history of uh, trap drummers and how that industry just completely went away with talking pictures. Um, It's a really cool episode. Kelly is... Kelly's a great, great person and uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, my wife had a baby about five days ago, so I'm just like, I could not find any time to edit uh, the the shows that I've already got recorded, but couldn't get them right, ready to go in time. So I thought it'd be neat to re- release this first episode again. Um, it's a little different format-wise. Uh, it's pretty much the same, but it just sounds kind of different because I didn't know what I was doing. Not that I, I do now, but... Um, uh, I had, hadn't heard it in four years, and I, I loved listening to it, um, and I hope you guys do too. Maybe I'll do this again periodically, kind of re-release some some company histories like Ludwig and, and shows like that, which are way early on, so you may miss them 150-plus episodes in, but uh, this gives you a chance to listen back um, and uh, learn this from those old episodes. So anyway, enjoy this uh, first episode of Drum History Podcast from April of 2018. Hello and welcome to the podcast. We have Kelly Ray Tubbs with us today to discuss trap drummers in the silent movie era. Kelly, how are you? Hi, I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for asking me to join you today. Awesome. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. All right, so let's get into the topic that we're here to talk about today, the trap drummers in silent movies. In layman's terms, what is a trap drummer and what is he doing in the silent movies thing? What would his role be? A trap drummer. So let's let's get at the word trap is believed to come from, and that is from the word contraption. And all of those bits and pieces, the the whistles and, you know, the things that shake, rattle, or roll, as I like to describe them, um, those were all contraptions and shortened to the word traps. And what we find and what I've found in the images that I have uh, obtained through the years is that trap drummers not only played uh, bass drum and snare drum, cowbell woodblock cymbals just like the the early traditional jazz players but also the whistles the um, tuned cowbells some some people would have a set of eight tuned cowbells and others would have just a, a set of four which would be an arpeggio of some flavor and whistles so whistles that would imitate birds or machines or other animals and uh, vehicles like trains and steamboats, tugboats, you know, just any, ima- and, and weather would be another category of the kinds of sounds that people would be recreating for the purposes of um, vaudeville shows, um, sometimes circuses because there would be comedic elements within a circus like a clown's act. Yeah. And you might give a real big on a bass drum when a clown falls onto the ground or something. So uh, the trap drummers, regardless of the setting, would be accompanying these uh, comedic things, these environmental things, nature. So bringing just a little sense of reality to what they're seeing on screen. And originally music was added into the silent films not to not to enhance the movie, but to cover up the sounds of the streetcars and the cars outside the theater and the people inside the theater and the ventilation fans. Yeah, and the projector. And and... the sound of the projector, which was very loud. Yeah. So it was just used to cover up that, but then they realized that they could really use that music to enhance and to create mood. And then uh, when, you know, they, they went another layer by by adding the sound effects to make it a little bit more realistic by comparison. Wow, and that sells more tickets and that gets more people in the in the seats and gets more gets more drummers hired. Absolutely. The reason I have been so impressed and amazed with uh, your knowledge is because of your video series um, online, which is the Back in Time sound effects um, series, which you have multiple, which are all amazing. And we'll get a little bit uh, into that more down the road. But um, so you did the series with uh, William F. Ludwig III or Bill or B3, um, where you guys go through his collection that was belonged to 
was it his father's collection? Was it WFL 2? Was that all his stuff? Father and grandfather. Okay. So you guys go through this amazing history of these these items they would use that were created to make these sounds. Like this was not like, let's take um, this thing because it sounds like a horse clopping. Let's take this. It was it was marketed and sold to these trap drummers. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. There were several different companies that sold effects that um, that trap drummers would use. Um, and, and typically the percussion companies and the music retailers that went um, that sold through catalogs like JW Pepper which is uh, a company that is still in uh, in existence now in Texas uh, they were around in the early 1900s and they would have catalogs that would sell um, all sorts of sound effects and whistles as did the Ludwig company as did Noakes and Nikolai as did Yerkes so there were a, a yeah a lot of different companies because it was such big business, and with um, with Bill Ludwig's collection, you know these were things that had been sold through the Ludwig company, and some of them developed by, um, for example, the the Surefire shot machine. You know that that particular build that that model was exclusive to Ludwig. That is unbelievable. That that machine, which we can talk about here. I mean, <laughs> my, my God. Do you want to describe that? Let Let's get into the pieces they would use. I mean, and I predominantly the ones we're talking about are designed by Ludwig. But um, so let's start with uh, the Surefire machine. That is an amazing device. I I had so much fun learning about that. He he pulled it out of uh, of his bag of tricks and. I had no idea what it was. I, I just hadn't been exposed to it. And, and uh, in, in this way, ignorance is bliss because you, you get to learn, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's my deal. It's like, I love learning. And so this is just all like candy for me. It's like, what is that thing? Yeah. What is that Hunk thing? Hunk of metal with a bunch of holes in it. And then, oh, wait, there's a lot more to it than that. There is a lot more to it than that. So if you can imagine... Um, a piece of metal, several pieces of metal that are kind of hinged together. It's very tricky to describe, yeah. but it is about this. It's smaller than a, a pound of butter, if you can imagine that. So it's not very big. It's it's uh, just a couple inches tall, but it has a, a lid on top that opens up, and then these wings that spread out, and uh, the the wings each. Uh, if you have the wings closed. You can. Uh, there are, are chambers that are created where you can put in 16 32 caliber blank casings. That's heavy duty. Yeah, the wings are closed, the top hinge is closed, and then there are basically metal buttons, uh, one button that goes over each of the blanks. And so you're able to strike uh, each of the buttons either with a stick or a hammer or a mallet of some sort. And this super loud gunshot goes off. And believe me, I was uh, I got the got to play that. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the right word to say it's an instrument, but yeah. that device. And man, it was loud. I cracked the first one, and my ears immediately started ringing. And it it creates smoke and and flames that shoot out these side exit ports from the from this device um, because that energy has to go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So it shoots out the side and there's this huge billow of smoke and uh, it's crazy. I, I can't even imagine when this device would have been used in a movie theater and there was a, uh, you know, like a big shootout, how much smoke would have filled the theater because they didn't have great ventilation systems. No, no. For sure. And safety, and you're burning down the theater. I mean, not that that happened, but... Well, yeah, exactly. I suspect that they maybe had the Surefire machine sitting on a slab of marble or yeah. something that would not be 
uh, conductive to flames. Either that or they just took their chances. I don't know, but wow. but um, you'd, you'd think that they would want to have it on something that wasn't going to at least immediately catch fire. And uh, and of course, asbestos was um, was pretty popular back yep. then too. So maybe they just put it on a on a little flat piece of asbestos, which is its own whole. Uh, now we think, oh my God, they're <laughs> you're, you're playing <laughs> right. this on a slab of asbestos, but. So just to clarify, the Surefire machine would be sitting there or a Surefire instrument is sitting there and you're hitting it to explode these these blanks that sound like a gunshot to match to picture where there would be a, a, a shootout going on, where there may be, you usually don't fire one shot in a, um, in a, in a shootout. In a so, shootout. <laughs> so they would be matching to picture, going boom, 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 hitting it and to give people the... Uh, to represent, obviously, to kind of trick your senses and to think this is happening on screen, and and that's amazing. I mean, that is just so cool. Yeah, exactly. There were a couple of different methods. The Surefire machine was one. Um, there was another uh, device that was kind of, uh, if you can think about it, as the the cushion from a chair. Yeah. The seat cushion, and uh, with these. Um, boy, it's hard to say they were sticks, but beaters, yep. and they had kind of a flat surface, and you'd slap them onto this piece of, of leather. There was another half to it that was canvas, so you could simulate horses' hooves or gunshots with that device as well. So a couple of different ways to get the same kinds of sounds, um, but that Surefire machine is, is just a, an amazing piece of engineering. It's fantastic. You're re- you're getting that that sound. You're getting that sound of a gunshot versus like, oh, that kind of sounded like a car backfiring. It's the real yeah, deal. Yeah, there's no mistaking it. No, <laughs> it's absolutely the real deal. All right, so we got the Surefire machine. Now let's run through a couple other ones because again, you have to have your sure. your arsenal or your 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 uh, toolbox full of um, full of stuff. So uh, train sounds, and these are all obviously the cool thing is is you have a video with Bill Ludwig running through all of these. So I I really highly recommend listeners going from here to YouTube, and we'll have the link provided, but actually just you can see these and you can hear Bill talking about them. These are from the original collection. But um, So let's talk about the train sounds. I think that's a really cool one, which which to me, some of them are like, that sounds like it, but it's not, you know, it's almost 100 years old and it's, it's pretty good. But the train sounds, I am just like, you close your eyes and it sounds like a train. It does. It does. It's such a fascinating, again, it's like, you know, do you call it an instrument or do you call it a device? And yeah. I'm not sure. It's, there, there aren't moving parts except for yourself yeah, really. moving. So it's hard to call it a machine. It, it's a little tricky. It, it, it defies in some ways um, the, the right kind of definition. But if you can imagine, um, boy, what size box would that be? Kind of uh, the the size of a notebook. Okay. Like a, a two inch binder. Yeah, three ring I got gotcha. you. Some, yeah, something that size, but but totally rectangular, like a cigar box, with a slot running down one side, where you can insert a scraper, and that scraper is scraping over springs. Just the same kind of springs that you would have on a screen door on the back of your house, and when that scraper is scraped over the springs and done in a rhythmic fashion and that that wooden box is it serves as a resonance chamber it, it's amazing the sound that you can get out of that thing and and if you were to close your eyes and and not even have the visual um the visual image to to guide you to the thought of that's a train yeah. it still sounds like a train no it doesn't you and you start with the zoom zoom Jump, kind of building up in speed, and I mean, what a! And I know there. Uh, I, I remember Bill talking about how there was a. Um, it almost looks like a file, like that you put in there, and you yes. and you rub against the, yep. the springs. And I mean, what a fun! Uh, to, I imagine discovering these and creating them must have been a blast. Just to like say, hey, that sounds like a that sounds like a train. Let's 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 carry on and keep working on it and make it sound more like a train. Right, right. What, wait, what a. Just what a what a fascinating time, and and that would be true for anything that 
someone is developing. It's yes, uh, you know, it, it's this discovery and and making it a little bit better. Maybe somebody else has a device that's similar, and you're going to make it sound more authentic because of a change that you get to put into the into that instrument or device. Yeah, and and honestly, um, too, I got that thought of when when on top. There was the little kind of metal uh, frame that you would stick into it with a bell, which just appeared to be like a sheet of metal that you would go, jung, 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 and then hit the bell that's connected to it. So you get this kind of like all in, and then you all aboard. You can do this all in one kind it, of exactly, train, yeah. The, train the bell setup. plates, yeah, the bell, yeah, plate. the bell plates were were fantastic as well, and they uh, they they sound beautiful. It's like what a great, you know, for a for a rectangular hunk of metal flat rectangular hunk it's like boy that sounds really good <laughs> yeah it's got a good sound to it so then um moving on here let's let's lump these two together so we have uh the animal sounds like the birds and the horses and all those different sounds and i think it's amazing um we'll touch on the catalogs a little bit that when they actually sold them but there was so many different kinds of birds <coughs> Right, and I think that probably speaks to I don't know for sure because I haven't um, haven't really seen a, a a great number of silent films, but I think it speaks to the fact that a lot of the films were about everyday life topics. Yep. You know, it was inconceivable, I think, or at least in large part, to think about outer space. Oh yeah. And they didn't have computers, but they had machinery, um, but they definitely had farm life, they definitely had city life, they definitely had um, humor. So there might be a scene of a couple courting and they're out, you know, in a in a nearby field because there wasn't, you know, for many people there wasn't a, a, a metropolitan area that they lived in. They were, they were, you know, even, even big towns were small towns. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but, but nature is certainly uh, a common part, a common thread for all of those kinds of scenarios. And, and I think that's maybe why bird whistles were, were so common and that, that there were so many different kinds of birds. Yeah, and I think it's funny where bird imitations. there's so many of them where you, it makes you think there'd be a guy in the audience who'd go like, oh, that's not a sparrow. That's not how that way that sparrow sounds. Or I mean, they really hit a lot of different categories where uh, it's this attention to detail that I think um, kind of shows the the quality that would and the thought that went into this and how big of an industry it would be for for Ludwig or for these companies. Right, and I think it also dovetailed with the fact that there were a lot of people who hunted birds. Yeah, wow. So I don't think that all of them had to do with movies i think some of them um and in fact you know maybe a good third of those bird imitations actually came because they were hunting the birds i never and, thought and of that, that that's came amazing from a different yeah a different tradition and that that again it's just another one of those examples where where things dovetail that you you don't expect are related and yet they probably are yeah hunting I never, uh, never would have put that together, but because I mean, I guess just being a drummer, uh, you just think like, oh, this is for drums. But and then quickly in the animal world, we also have the horses, which I think is just like you close your eyes and you hear this, the clip clop of this. And again, referring to your video with uh, Bill, the way it's shaped and the cup on the inside, it is designed and tested and refined to make a perfect horse sound where you can speed it up and you have the two of them and you're making this you're really making a vivid horse sound right right and and changing the the kind of material that you're playing those upon changes the whole sound it, it's uh it's taking advantage of the resonance chamber and taking advantage of texture and and, and like the 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 band arrangements from the early teen or you know the early 1900s that music was all about texture and that's the same thing here because there wasn't this very detailed soundtrack 
um, that that we've grown accustomed to in our day and age, they had to fill up a lot of sound and and they wanted to make it as colorful and as expressive as they could given some means that were a little more primitive by comparison to today. Also, just the the more in the sound effects world, the, like, um, the police rattles, where it kind of comes back to what the content of the movie is about. You probably have a lot of police chases and cops and robbers and stuff like that, where they would use this, this spinning, this kind of police rattle sound to to create that, to evoke something that people, the people hear. And now that police rattle would be used by police, obviously, to, to get the attention or why don't you just, I mean, how does, how did the police rattle work? Uh, The police rattle, we know that today as the ratchet. And just a side note, it was, uh, uh, you know, when I was in high school, and junior high school and, and having ratchets that were called for in concert band music, there was that little bracket that nobody ever knew what it was for, right? Yeah. And it was so common in the early 1900s, such a, a go-to instrument, that that bracket is actually made so that they can hook that onto the counter hoop of your bass drum. Oh my gosh, and then it just continued on to be to be a part of it and no one no one knows what it's for exactly yeah it it has become obsolete uh, you know with the with the advent of the talking movies you didn't need to have that handy anymore and that purpose has kind of gone by the wayside but um yeah, so so it, it's um it's a little bit mind-boggling to think how these metamorphoses happen and but when you get back to the roots of it you make this odd discovery you know? yeah you like, see oh that's oh my that's gosh for. this was this was yeah this was so common back then and and so getting back to how those um ratchets were used and as police rattles they the the police had those as standard issue and all the london bobbies had them and policemen in america had them and they would use that as an alert be- because it is a a, a striking sound even today when you listen to a ratchet yeah. being played it was a striking sound and they would they would whip these things around in the air because it was on a steady post instead of um instead of that kind of double legged ratchet that we see today yeah. it would just be on a handle and they would swing it around in the air and that would get the attention of other policemen who you know were kind of trained to listen for that sound and just general passers-by who might be able to come to assist in an emergency and they would alert people with uh, to fires oh they wow. would use a yeah they would use you know fire emergency medical situation anything the the police or fire department whatever um would would be using that to to let people know, hey, there's a situation here, folks. Because it's so cutting that it just cuts through the sound, and then it's a part of everyday life. So then it probably ends up in these uh, moving pictures at that time. So people, it just brings more of a real, like a reality to uh, to what you're watching. To hear that, it evokes that emotion of like almost, I would say, panic. Because when you hear that grrr, that that ratchet, you think, uh oh, something's going on. Someone needs help, or there's a problem. And it kind of gets your your heart right. rate pumping a little bit more. Absolutely. So people were uh, were were playing with our emotions even back then. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's funny. So again, I really highly recommend everyone to go and look. In you can actually hear them and see them um, at uh, Kelly's YouTube page with uh, with Bill F. Ludwig the Third, who is I haven't met him yet, but he seems like a great guy. Yeah, we had a lot of fun filming those videos. Um, I was able to bring him in as an expert on a grant that I was awarded that allowed me to to study those instruments and and to create the videos. That is so, awesome! Congratulations so my, my on the grant. Have to, yeah, my thanks uh, goes out to the East Central Regional Arts Council who provided the funding for all of that. Awesome! Well, you're very very uh, well deserving of it. You you have uh, used it used it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. It's everything's going great. We're using these sound effects. Trap drummers are, you know, you're you got th- either one to three to four of them working. Then 1927 is when I have the first, uh, like the jazz singer with Al Jolson, the first talkie coming out. Now let's let's just get into a little bit about how things kind of went from being a world with trap drummers to this just not even existing anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't know the exact year. I, I do know it's late twenties. I'm always uh, I, I I learned an important lesson uh, not to say what was first because yeah. there's some uh, there's usually something that was firster. That's that's the quote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it might just not be as well known or something. Yep, you're smart. Smart that's, to do that. Yeah, that's right. And and actually, so what preceded the the films that came with a soundtrack as a as an integrated part were movies that were released with records that you would drop the needle in uh you know at a specific time yeah with a film so the concept of incorporating music with film was already uh, a thought and at that point then you know if you're incorporating music you're probably also incorporating some of the sound effects as well yeah and so that comes in between the moving pictures with completely no sound and the moving pictures complete with sound interesting that little middle yeah that little middle ground that a lot of people aren't really familiar with and including myself i i know that it existed i haven't gotten to dig into that i haven't gotten to to view a movie that had an accompanying set of records that you would play simultaneous to the to the film well that just gives me the thought of changing records a lot you're having a guy up in the uh, projection room who's dry, like i imagine there's similar to like there's like the, the three beeps and then you drop it i just think people are watching this and the guy a couple times has to be off you know what I mean? Where he drops it a split second later and then the dial, like sounds aren't syncing up and the problems that would come from that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That would drive me insane in that, in that era, but I'm sure, you know, you don't know what you don't have again. Well, right, right. Yeah. You don't know what you don't have. And, uh, the, the way that it allowed the studios to be in better charge of what music was played. Yeah. Because that's the other thing that is um, that is important to note that when a movie got sent out to an area, uh, you know, it's like here your, your reels of film come in and your pianist is here. Let's say that it's just a pianist and not an entire uh, small theater orchestra, but your pianist comes in and your pianist might or might not receive a recommended list of music that is appropriate for this scene and hmm. that scene and the next scene and the following scene. So if they do not have that music readily available, they need to pick something from their own personal collection that is like that. So the same movie viewed in one town might have a completely different emotional feel than the same movie played in the next town over just because of the musical choices that were made. So much room for error. A lot of room for error, but again, then you also have to think, well, these people were professional musicians and they would also do their best. Yeah, of course. And, and so, you know, it, it could have been very different. It could have been negligible mm -hmm. indifference. And, and, you know, we it's, it's so hard to find people who were living and are able to tell us their experiences from watching the movies and that puts us in a hard position here because we have to make a lot of guesses based on the information we have and the things that make sense. What we have are magazines that were published on a monthly basis that that sent out sheet music that was appropriate for a hurry scene and mm. appropriate for a chase scene and appropriate for a storm scene. And so a lot of musicians across the the globe would have used these magazines um, to have that catalog of music that was really built more for the purpose of films and that it kind of dovetails with these instruments that were built for the purpose of entertainment. Wow. Talk about a rabbit hole. You're going into the, the world of the magazine. I, I am, I am magazine. so rabbit holed, yes. I know, wow. <laughs> there are so many different rabbit holes to go down. It's, I know. Uh, it, it is a little bit never ending. It is. Hopefully we can spark the uh, the fire in some people to get out there and, and do more more discovering on that. But um, okay, so I'm a trap drummer. It's mid 1920s. I'm working. I have many gigs happening. It's great. I start to see that there are talking pictures coming out where they are accompanying 
the music and, and they don't they put on a record they don't need me does now does my boss the theater owner say hey we don't need you tonight how does that go what how, what is the development of uh starting to say we don't need you as much on this one versus this industry is non-existent anymore how does that go i think that was probably uh I, I don't know for sure, but I think it was probably a pretty short turnaround. I think it was, we've got these sounds that come with the movies, and, you know, we're, see ya, see yeah. ya, Charlie. Now get your <laughs> gunshot machine out of here. We don't need it anymore. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think that it was a, a pretty, a pretty, uh, fast change in a lot of people's lives at that time. So a lot of people lost their jobs. I think they did, Yeah. I think a, a lot of drummers in a lot of scenarios at the turn of the century lost their jobs as, and to machines in one way or another. Hmm. Um, for example, roller rinks were very popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And, at, you know, when you're thinking about a roller rink, it's kind of circular in that area in the middle. Nobody skates in it, right? Yeah. Well, that's because they used to put a band in the middle. Oh, wow. And not to mention also, you know, tight corners and stuff. But, but yeah, they, there used to be musicians um, oftentimes performing in the middle. And I've, I've got a, 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 a photograph of a roller rink, I think in Ohio. And it's got a totally fenced off area. So you, you can't accidentally bump through and into this area where a small orchestra would be performing and there's a little lectern for the conductor to have just a little bit of raised stuff. And so you look inside this roller rink, and already at this time, the musician's jobs had ended. I think it was maybe 1909 that my image is from, because one of those uh, player piano type of organs that has uh, all of the other, literally the bells and the whistles and the drums and it, it's uh, so that's sitting there and the rest of the cage is empty no chairs wow <laughs> no chairs that's for funny. musicians and then there were other roller rinks where the musicians were in a mezzanine above the roller rink level and that would free up the entire space for skating so uh you know so those jobs ended there's a different point to be made though and that is that um they didn't realize it but the vaudeville actors kind of wrote their own their own demise uh, because the studios would come to them and say hey you know you vaudeville act you're great here let's get you on film oh. and so they they did that because you know great they're now they're going to be seen by a whole lot of people which was wonderful for them it was easier than touring and less expensive than touring and they'd get paid a bigger sum of money for less less hours of work yeah. not realizing that it was writing their own ticket to to uh, lack of work you get paid once you're done that's right you you get paid once and then the studio can show that as many times as they like wow and so hand in hand with that with the vaudeville act getting less and less work because the studio you know the the they're no longer needed in the same way. Well, then the musicians that performed in that theater, the theaters that were closing down, they were out of work. And the roller rink drummers were out of work. And the silent picture drummers were out of work. And Chautauqua's kind of fell by the wayside. And so they were out of work. You, you had a lot of different kinds of drummers trap drummers who were you know kind of uh, their their roles were being uh, downsized or replaced and so it, it it just makes it more important for you to be very good at what you do now I wanted to ask you also um, about um, the manufacturers you mentioned that Ludwig and there's a lot of them doing it but I know that it would be you know I don't want to say 50 percent but a lot of their catalog would be these uh, trap instruments and these different varieties of noisemakers and the surefire machine and, and all that stuff, that all went away. There were certainly pages dedicated to it, but let's, well, you know, then again, though, I'm, I'm thinking about um, 
catalogs from the mid to late 20s where there, at that time jazz was already taking, you know, and, and common music as compared to orchestral music was already taking such a lead and was so popular, people were gearing up for that that the pages dedicated to sound effects and to whistles. It's you know, you don't really have to have a description or or a, a picture so much of an item that costs fifty cents. A wood block is kind of a wood block. Yeah, it's really? kind of a wood block. Yeah. But the the drum the, the features on this drum, which is a rope tension, versus the features is of this drum, which is a Prussian style uh, single rod tension, versus this drum, which is thumb rod tension, versus this drum, yeah. which is um, uh, a single rod tension, but it's self aligning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, versus double tension. Yeah, you know, that was much more important and much more critical to companies like Ludwig and Ludwig and Leedy and Noakes and Nikolai. Yeah, so they can they can stand to lose the page of bird whistles, but they focus then more on the details of of the the emerging technology and different tunings and all that kind of stuff, right? Right, and, and it doesn't take a lot. You know, a, a a quail whistle looks a lot like a a bob white whistle looks yeah. a lot like a dove call looks a lot like you know it's and everybody I think they were common enough that people knew what they looked like. All you needed was just a line. Yeah. To describe it, this is what it is. This is the sound it makes. Here's the cost. So yeah. hen cackle this much, cow ball this much. Uh, you know, all all sorts of different kinds of sounds. Squawker was a little more unique looking, and so they really needed a, a picture of that until it was either popular or no longer used. Wow. Yeah, you got to have the squawker in there. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it doubles as a as a as a hen. And a, and a pig, and uh, a couple of different things. So well, it, was, it, it was a versatile little instrument. Yeah, and it seems like with uh, with these, all of these, like you know, in being in this world, being a trap drummer, you got to say that um, you got to you got to know you can use this for a bunch of different things. You hit this a certain way on the side, then that's that. So it's it's about being versatile and and knowing how to get all the sounds out of these different instruments. Right, right. A, a cow ball, which is um, it, it's spelled. B A W L, so like a, like somebody's bawling, really? right? Yeah. And it's that moo sound, and it's a long metal tube that has a reed inside of it. And some of the cow balls were built in such a way that you could uh, kind of uh, vibrate the end of it with your hand, kind of shake it in your hand. That this this tube. And you could make it sound like a horse whinny as well. Now, not every brand of cow balls did this. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you had to be a discerning trap drummer to save yourself some money and yeah. to, and to yeah, not only that, but to minimize how difficult it was to get all of your gear to the gig, which is, again, the same challenge that same we have today. challenge today. That's the key of this whole thing is drummers are drummers. These guys are getting, they're fighting against uh, their version of a drum machine and programming and... Trying to, they're losing their gigs to technology. I mean, it is. I think yes. that's the biggest thing I learned today is that there's no difference between us. We're just, it's just a different kind of gear, and you're fighting with. They had, they had their whole different world of problems with tuning and tack heads and all this and stuff. Absolutely, and you know, when you when you are a person who has a job at a theater, let's say, and you don't own a car either because you don't have one yet or because they're not invented yet. You know, how are you getting your stuff to the gig? Yeah, Because really. you still have to get you and your gear to the gig. Yeah. And so if you're on a, a cable car system, well, how much can you carry? Because you're only allowed to take you and what you can carry. And there's probably another drummer right behind you who will find a better way to get it there, and he wants your gig, which again is the same as That's today. right. That's right. He's a little more portable than you, or he shows up on time because he's not relying on a horse that doesn't want to move today, <laughs> or, or whatever. You know, there are. Again, it's the same situation as we are today. Well, Kelly, where can people uh, where can people find you? Like, what's the best way to 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 watch your videos and to hear about what you're doing as a clinician? And just where where can people find you? 
Oh, people can find me on my website, which is www.kellyraytubbs.com. And I've got links to the videos there. Uh, I have links to upcoming events like clinics, like um, per, you know, big performances. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, and then also a YouTube channel. So you can just type in the name Kelly Ray Tubbs and they can find me there as well. They can find uh, currently 18 different historical videos. So some of those feature the history of um, the early drum set components from the early drum set. Not not so much the history of the drum set, but um, but a little bit uh, a little deep dive, a miniature deep dive into things like the woodblock and and how we in the United States put it onto our drum sets and cymbals and, and how that changed from the orchestral use of cymbals to a little bit closer to how we use them today, particularly the hi-hat. If you find these videos, prepare to sit there and watch every single one of them because they are <laughs> so interesting and so well done. I mean, really, it is it is impressive the amount. It, you can tell the amount of love and care that you put into into making them i mean it i really i really do love it and i want to spell so it's k oh, well, thank you k-e-l-l-i-r-a-e-t-u-b-b-s just to help people find it kelly ray tubbs um and you can find her all over the place and uh Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk with me. You are a wealth of information, and I would love to have you back, and we can talk about some different stuff. I mean, there's so many. Doing this podcast, it is just so many. Every little detail, like the hi-hat, we'll probably do something on that. There's just, it's a, it's endless. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, first of all. And I've had a blast, so I would love to come back. Anytime you need me, let me know. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly, so much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. I want to give a huge thank you to Kelly for taking the time to talk with us today. If you like this podcast, find me on all the social media platforms at Drum History. And please share, rate, and leave a review of the podcast. And also, let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. <laughs>